about the project which we run here in Innsbruck, and uh, it's about uh, cadaster maps. The Austrian-Hungarian Empire, as you can see here, completed the first cadaster in the late or in the second half of the 19th century. So the cadaster was uh, created between 1817 and 1861. And it uh, comprises a huge area, so 670,000 square kilometers. So in comparison, Germany today has something about 357,000 square meters. So a really large uh, an, um, undertaking, which was uh, started and took, as you can see here, 50 years. Actually, this cadaster contains two main sources. Uh, so on the one hand, the detailed maps, which were drawn uh, for each uh, land, and uh, it had mainly a military purpose. So uh, the military wanted to know actually exactly, wanted to have an exact map of the whole empire. And the accompanying papers, so descriptions describing how the land was used, had mainly the purpose uh, to standardize tax uh, payment in Austria. So tax payment, it was the idea that it should be independent from, uh, from local uh, situations, but that there is a standardized way to access uh, the, and, and classify the whole area in the empire. The quality of the data is extremely high, so it uh, was uh, done by the military and the surveyors, they were instructed very carefully. There were real laws and actually they didn't change the way they gathered all the data. So it was consistent. Uh, well, of course, uh, there are always uh, uh, detailed problems with data, but in principle, the data are consistent over a long period of time. And uh, funny to know that uh, the surveyors had to buy uh, their uh, equipment on themselves. And, and they were also, uh, if they, they were li liable if uh, errors appeared. So it was, uh, for some people, it was uh, half of their life they spent to travel through the empire and to, um, to uh, draw the cadaster maps and uh, make also the um, descriptions. So the sheets of the cadaster map drawn according to a scale of 1000 to 2880. And this is rather detailed and there were people who checked, verified the data within these um, cadaster maps and the usual accuracy is about 80 centimeters. They recorded all plots of land, so also those here in the Alps, which are not used, we are just yeah, deserted ground. And a lot of information went into these maps. This information is also contained in the descriptions, so it's not only in the maps, but it is visualized in the maps, but it is also contained in the descriptions. So as you see here, there are different colors used for grazing land, for meadows, for fields, for wine yards, for houses, wooden houses are in yellow, or public houses in red. Even the type of the woods is recorded within the maps. So these colorful maps are available for, it's about 300,000 such maps are existing for the whole empire and um, for the Austrian part and also for some other parts they have already been scanned completely by the Austrian uh, Bundesamt für Eichen Vermessungswesen, so uh, the, the official administration for, for the maps. And actually this cadaster is still valid in a legal way and it is, it is really the first and the, the starting point for the modern cadaster. Um, it is, uh, as you can see from the, or as you can remember from the, um, from the borders I've shown you before, um, this, you will find these cadaster maps not only here in Austria, but of course in Hungary, in Romania, in Bulgaria, 
in Ukraine, uh, in Czech Republic, in Slovakia, Slovenia, Croatia, and, uh, and Italy. And actually in Italy it, it forms also an own, an own uh, regime of, of cadaster maps. This is a detail from these maps. As you can see, the different colors and the parcel numbers in the maps and also the different kinds of uh, bushes and trees and so on indicating directly how it is planted and so on. So it's a really extremely valuable source. The interesting thing is that digitization was going on with, uh, with the maps but uh, and I think uh, there is a um, Hungarian company called Mapire which, is, uh, which acquired these maps and is now selling them to f family historians. But the interesting thing is that the accompanying documents are in some way even more interesting because they contain the information. Uh, they are not colorful and not uh, a bit boring, of course, uh, but yeah, you can uh, find uh, all the information which is then uh, drawn in the maps. So you find numbers of the parcels, uh, the name of the owner, the location of the owner, the size and the kind of usage as we have seen before in the maps. And then very important, the description of the borders. So this is running text. So when they did the drawing, they went along the borders and described each border and each point which you can see in the map. Therefore they needed of course the field names they had to record, uh, they talked with the people and, and the people told them, yes, this wood is called in that way and this wood or this field is uh, called in that way. And that's, of course, also a very interesting uh, source because um, uh, uh, you have a lot of names included in the cadaster maps which you will not find in the official uh, maps at that time because this is very detailed and, and the farmer who owns his land, of course, will tell uh, how, he, how he says to this and uh, that part. And there are some other documents included, uh, such as uh, um, index cards and so on. So here is uh, that you get an idea of how, this, how the main table looks like. It's uh, the land register with all this information. And here is a uh, detail from the column which describes the name of the owner. And here you can also see a specific thing that this owner is called Plunzer. And then you see a funny sign and Klosen and Alois. So the name of this guy was Alois Plunzer, but uh, the house he was living in was called uh, Klosen. And that's still um, a, a very, and, and self, therefore the people never said to him Alois uh, Plumser, but they said uh, Klosner Alois. So the, the people are called according to their house names, which is a typical thing here in, uh, in the Alpine area, but also in other areas in, in Austria and is still, still there. So again, you have uh, information which you usually do not get from official documents where people are just uh, recorded according to uh, their name. And we were talking before about uh, disambiguation of names. So here you have an interesting way to disambiguate uh, people because uh, they are called according to their house names. Then the border descriptions, so these are running text and then also list of landowners which was used uh, to get an overview at that time and the field names. Now here's a professor at the university, Kurt Shah, who works on these cadaster documents since uh, many years and is also editing some of them and uh, together with him we uh, set up a project for a call which was uh, placed by the, Austrian, by the Tyrolean government. It's called the Light Tower a project for digitization, one of the few projects which uh, deals with historical documents. And we got a grant of about uh, 200,000 euro. 50% uh, of it uh, will go to the Transcribus team. And uh, the project is now running for 
a bit more than a year and uh, should be finished at the end of this year. We started in our proposal, I mean, the proposal was written much earlier. It took, of course, some time to evaluate and so on and so on. So we were rather careful not to promise too much. And therefore, we said at the beginning that we just want to make them searchable for users so that they can simply search in the documents and, and see what their grandfather or grandmother or whoever, which properties were owned by these people. But uh, now we became a bit more ambitious and uh, are thinking to extract the data and to build up an extra database uh, with the support of uh, volunteers so that, um, that really these valuable data are recorded in an exact way and can be used by the researchers. And that's actually maybe, I think uh, the talk from uh, Hervé was um, really great because it was based on automatically um, extracted data. Of course, there is the problem with the noise and um, you have to get an idea of how much influences the noise, which is of course produced by automated methods, how much influences this um, the, 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 the visualization, the data extraction you have seen before. But on the other hand, if you have really large amount of data, it will be the only way to do it in an automated way. So um, I think what, what, what we saw um, before is really the future and uh, I believe that, that data extraction from historical documents can be the next big thing uh, in our community. Here it's a bit different because as I said before, um, the, the colleague um, is very much interested in exact data and wants to, to have uh, yeah, more or less 100% accurate data. Therefore, the approach is a bit different, um, similar to uh, HDR uh, correction. If, if HDR correction requires or comes, or if HDR processing comes with an error rate of 12-15%, there will not be any improvement compared to uh, writing from scratch. And, uh, but uh, if you are not interested in, in uh, um, transforming um, automatic, uh, automatically processed text into a correct text, then of course 12% um, character rate are high and, 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 and not uh, um, perfect, but already provide you with something. And uh, as long as you know that you are dealing with noisy data, it will be extremely useful. And I think that's something which, is, which, which can be applied more or less to every project, that uh, the final goal is the final goal really to have 100% correct data, or is, the final or is it okay to have the best model which can be done? Yeah, so the objective for searching, that was rather easy to achieve because with the structure recognition tool we got within Transcribus and the new HDR plus model and so on, it was done rather quickly to create uh, good uh, training data both for the structure recognition and the HDR model. And here is a very simple search interface for searching. So we, due to the fact that the recognition is below 2% character error rate. Due to the fact that uh, recognition is um, below 2% character error rate, there is uh, actually no need to use the keyword spotting uh, application to find more or less uh, all words in the document. And uh, we restricted the search here just to the uh, family names or person names so that people can search for their Ancestors, as we promised in the in the proposal, and um, what we use here is uh, the, the standard Lucene search index, which you have seen yesterday. The uh, talk from Felix, and um, we display 
here just um, according to the document type. So there are different documents, you could select the documents, different uh, communes, so the usual way to make facets, and then users come directly to the document. Here we are playing around with an overlay, might be helpful or might not be helpful, it depends on, I mean, this can be, that's still subject to experimentation. In some cases, it's a nice feature to, to understand what is written here, but on the other hand, in this case, the writing is rather neat and people likely will, will know it uh, anyway, what it means. As I already said, we sent the text and the images to our service provider in Vietnam and uh, generated two models, the structure model and an HDR model. Uh, and for both, we, we got uh, really uh, good results. So as you can see, we worked with 1,000 regions for the columns and 41,000 words as training material for the uh, handwriting. We were not able so far to test it against the whole data set because uh, the scanning process is still going on, but we expect that we need not to add too much data for um, completing the HDR results. Now the new or extended objective would be to do also something with crowdsourcing for this, docu uh, for this uh, kind of document with the final goal to, uh, to involve volunteers and to get a perfect record or a perfect database of the data included in the descriptions. And likely this will be an uh, application on its own, so searching and, and crowdsourcing. The tasks are rather clear. We need to create the layout, we need to transcribe documents, and we need to review the results. And I already mentioned this uh, consideration that if correction is needed anyway, we really have to be careful if the gain in efficiency by automated pro processing is really high enough to justify the overall effort. And uh, we had yesterday a discussion in the, in the uh, workshop and it was interesting to hear that uh, several people were also, they had also the opinion that uh, it is uh, more motivating for volunteers to do something fresh than to correct uh, stupid errors of a machine. And uh, therefore our current approach uh, goes in the direction to provide a very simple tool to mark the rows of a table, to provide a transcription interface which exactly contains the structure of the tables and to help with the automated transcriptions users in transcribing but they would do it manually and, and then to add some Excel-like features to the, um, to the uh, edit interface so that the input of data is as simple as possible. And that could look like uh, this, that users, so that uh, below you see the table structure, you might mark a row, put in data, and then as you can see here, in many cases, data are just repeated. So the owner of this land had several parcels and they even had the same function or the same data included except a few, in this case, just the size of the parcel differs. So a simple copy function might be fully sufficient to support users to uh, um, put in the data. Then the third task would be to review the data. And here are some considerations. So we also had a discussion, an interesting discussion yesterday that often it is a bottleneck in crowdsourcing uh, projects that, uh, that the researchers or those who are archivists or those who are responsible for or who are the project owners and want to uh, get the data, that um, the crowd is working fast and uh, then there is the problem who cares about the input of the crowd. And we got a very interesting um, uh, feedback here from the Fele Handen uh, project team who said that they can see that if there is 
uh, too long time span between the input of data by the crowd and the final reviewing, uh, that this demotivates the crowd and they see projects uh, declining if, if the gap is too high between the data input by the, by the crowd and, and reviewed by the, by the reviewers. So um, it is likely a good idea to allow um, users to have both roles, transcribers and reviewers, so that they can have both roles and feel responsible that both tasks are fulfilled. For this, I think it is also a good idea to make the reviewing process transparent to users. So one idea is uh, that users also have the chance to somehow see the history of what they did or to get notified uh, for um, uh, changes which are done by other users or reviewers to their um, documents or to their input and, and to visualize this uh, data to the users. Um, the idea, I mean, this is something which I think could also be very useful for transcription projects because I know from myself actually that uh, if you are not an expert in transcribing and if you are a bit unsure, um, you cannot always use an, an, un, an unclear tag because the writing is not unclear it's, and you know your, your ability or your capabilities is uh, not so high, but you want to, to provide something because you can read 80 or 90 percent of the text. Uh, but in many cases you are not that, not, not that sure. And if you get the chance to get notified on this, or if I would get the chance to get notified on this and to see also visualized, ah, these are the words which, which, where I had problems and where I made mistakes, um, I would not see it as an, uh, as a, as a, um, uh, that is offending me, but that uh, it is helping me to learn. So I think that that is a clever idea. And then, of course, large crowdsourcing platforms uh, have the chance also to have several rounds of reviewing. And that's another way, of course, to guarantee the quality which is required. So there are projects like in Sumiverse which have even 30 rounds of reviewing data coming from, from the crowd. Yeah, visualize the data, that's obvious. And of course, uh, one of the nice things would be to link the maps with accompanying documents. And so we have to deal with the numbers on the maps. They contain the parcel number and of course the same number is included here. We tried out in this case to do some uh, recognition of the parcel numbers, but uh, error rates are rather high and this is often, can often be seen with uh, numbers that, uh, that, is, um, that they are not so, um, do not provide that, that good results. Uh, so the same, the same uh, uh, consideration will be applied that it is likely easier to type it in than to make all the automated processing and, and receive error, too high error rates for a crowdsourcing project. The same is true for number detections because, of course, you would, would need first to find the numbers on the map and this is also a task on its own and you can imagine that you will get a lot of false positives in, in this case to find here the numbers. And it is extremely easy to think on a tool like in Transcribus where you just mark uh, uh, the baseline of, um, of this number and you get the rectangle automatically and then you would do this for the map and finally get the list or whatever where you can input the data. And here it could also be an option to have a plus or minus button so that you just say okay the next one is just one higher or one lower whatever. So uh, I could imagine that this is something which can be done on the mobile device as well in a nice uh, way. If the users are working and if one of the two documents is already transcribed or uh, the map is also marked, it is then a trivial job to match 
the two numbers and to get or to notify even the user uh, that here is a description available or here is already something available in the map. And finally, of course, uh, this would be linked via the database and allow the user to jump from either the map to the description or from the description to the map. And since this blue part uh, shall symbolize the database, uh, once you have the correct data in the database, you can also do a lot of interesting uh, further calculations or further processing because um, then you have really the clear data and you can do all kinds of data analysis. The final goal would be there is an um, interesting application from the Tyrolean government. It is called Historical Maps in Tyrol and they did really a great job. So they are working with ArcGIS and they are um, uh, geo-referencing all historical maps in Tyrol. So they have now I think at least 100 or more maps from the earliest maps in the 16th, 17th century up uh, to modern maps, well, still historically, I think they go until uh, 1930 or something like this. And so the idea is to include the whole cadaster maps into this application. Here's a test object already included. And, and the nice thing for us is, of course, that they are uh, geo-referenced and therefore they know also the borders of the Cadastra uh, communes, and these are exactly those uh, which are uh, included in the Cadastra documents. So it, it would be simple to link from the, the Cadastra commune description or from the database to exactly these maps, not on a, a detailed level, but on the border of the commune. And uh, so we, we can imagine an application where users either start here in this historical map application and come to the database or to the original documents or they start in our application and come also to this. And of course, if rights allows, uh, the, the, the images here uh, can be uh, retrieved within our application as well. Unfortunately, um, we have here rights problems, so uh, uh, it's not clarified so far how this will be possible. Okay, thank you a lot. Thank you. Any questions, maybe? In your slide, current status, the, they have written about concept is finished, and, in, and then uh, many discussions. Why are there so many discussions? And uh, can you give me some examples? Yeah, good question. I think mm, the discussions are mainly about this topic. Uh, shall we do it automatically or shall we do it in a more manual way? And uh, some team members in our team think we should do it with automated processing, so table recognition and that kind of processing. And I'm a bit more conserva conservative and I think uh, it, it as, I, as I have described before, um, a simple approach um, could be enough from my point of view. So these are mainly the discussions between developer and project owner. <laughs> Is it possible to add a feature to transcribers to support GeoTIFF or one of the other georeferenced image files, file formats? Because then your XML file will give you the location of the object or the tag in spatial coordinates. Mm, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, to, to add a a geo reference is not a big issue, but but um, uh, I don't think that 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 we are really prepared to to deal with this. So um, maybe, yeah, I think that's that's the answer.
people to Have you made tests with uh, recognizing names on the maps, not just numbers? No, we didn't make tests uh, for the names or for the um, uh, place names on the, on the map. I'm rather optimistic in contrast to the, to the numbers. I'm optimistic that you would get a good model with this Peter Pala tool, which we have shown also in the workshop, to find here. Because that's from the pixel structure, I think that's um, very uh, separate or very distinct from, from the other parts. With the, with the little numbers, I'm, I'm a bit more uh, skeptical. Uh, we got the advice from RW yesterday in the workshop, we should try it out, so we will try it out. Uh, and, and we'll see. And of course, I mean, if we would need to process a much larger amount of data, then uh, there would be no way uh, to do it in an automated way. But here we are talking not about that much data, it's just Tyrol. And I think that, yeah, I already mentioned the arguments, but so I think it's, it's fine to do it in a, in a manual way. Thank you very much, Gunther. First reaction, wow. Uh, uh, and also a remark, uh, one of the uh, projects uh, that, that uh, one, of the one of the types of Vailhand projects uh, is dealing in the Netherlands with uh, population indexes. Actually, uh, it looks uh, the same as, uh, as this kind of source, also with tables. Um, it, it's very uh, recognizable that you have the same problem with entering the data and the control, indeed, of the data. There's a uh, flash uh, Yes, of course. There is also another option, and I'm curious if you uh, talked about that. Uh, and that's uh, if you have uh, the, the, the if that's if you compare the uh, let all the records be entered twice by volunteers. And uh, then you can very easily, uh, by controllers, uh, they, they can only see where, where corrections have been made. A very simple check, this is the correct one, this is not the correct one, and go on, and go on. It, it goes way quicker. Yes, sure. I mean, several rounds have been mentioned and visualized data. So that's exactly what, what you say, so that you might get... Uh, but then, of course, um, yeah, it depends really on... on on the difficultiness of, of how, how hard it is uh, to interpret the data. In that case, it's rather simple, I believe. Um, I'm still confused about the difference between uh, structures and tables. Are you here structuring or mm. are you using I, the table We used here the structure tool. We used here the structure tool uh, just to extract the column. Uh, the table has a rather complicated logical structure. And um, it is not easy to find rows in, in tables. You have seen the figure for more complicated tables, of course, something like 80% or a bit more, 85%. So that's good uh, for automated extract extraction. But maybe if I just need to click, it makes not a big issue to make some clicks or to, to correct some, yeah? So, um, as I always say, it's, 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 it's a question if, if I gain so much for a simple task like this. But from the technology, it's different, or maybe in the, in the base it is also similar. Uh, but for us, um, it's, it looks, of course, uh, different. Yeah, here we are. Um, thank you very much. We're going to finish up with a bit of a question and answer session now. So you have all three of the board here on the stage with all of the answers that we could possibly have. Um, so we just want to wrap up with a discussion or if there's anything more that you want to ask about our plans over the next six months to year as we're figuring out things behind the scenes or if there are any requests that you have or anything that you would like to highlight. Um, there is within your pack, there is the user conference survey. So if you'd rather put things down in paper then, and drop it into the box downstairs at the front desk, fine. And also if you think about things later, and you have some concerns. We've had some really great 
talks over the coffee break about some concerns, particularly about the pricing model, do drop us an email as well with some bullet points if, if you've got some issues that you want to raise. It's so important that we get your feedback on the plans that we've shown today. But what we'd like to do now is just have a, a Q&A discussion. So if you've got any comments or any questions that you want to ask in person, well, we'll all hear. Does anyone want to start with that? Where's the next, next TUC? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, um, any suggestions for the next TUC? You should have put an Edinburgh, but only if there's no snow. I didn't think much about the modus about this, but um, it could also be an idea to, to have it uh, not always at the same place. I mean, we changed from Vienna to Innsbruck. Um, so if there are volunteers, um, we are happy <laughs> to. Would you like another user conference? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I have a question on the uh, bug request and the feature request that we can do by clicking on the bug. Um, it's sort of an empty, uh, a big black box what happens with it and uh, my colleague from uh, Oslo says that he, well, he makes screen dumps to illustrate and it would be really nice if we would know what other feature or bug requests have been done so that we don't go through the lengthy amount of time to report it but then because if you already know or someone else took the effort then that would save a lot of time so can there be some sort of uh, way that we know what bugs or feature requests are being done, being made? Well, they are read, but not answered. Um, the, que the, the main reason is that we already answer a lot of questions and if, if the developers really have to think on each idea for a feature request, it's a lot of work, actually. Actually, currently we're thinking a lot of uh, how we're going to manage uh, the community, how uh, we're going to provide information, and there's probably going to be uh, some sort of forum or other, so where you can also then use the search function and look in the forum what's already been requested, so you don't have to send your own request. So we're working on that as well. Any other things that anyone wants to raise? No? Everyone's tired and hungry now, right? We've worn you out in a day and a half. Um, in which case, I would just like to thank you, say thank you to the organisers uh, of the venue, particularly our folks helping out with the tech and uh, the caterers and everyone who's made this a success. And also to Gunther and Andy and their teams uh, in drawing us together. I really have to say thank you to Tamara and to uh, Johanna. They did 90% of the work. I was just disturbing them. This were my 10% 10, <laughs> my 10 uh, contribution. So really thank you a lot. Yeah, so thanks again. I hope you can take something home. We uh, had really a lot of input. Um, and yeah, as always, uh, it looks like uh, you would like to realize uh, everything you got as input uh, just in a few days. But then the next Monday will be an ugly Monday again. Um, yeah, so what to do. But uh, <laughs> we, we have heard a lot and, and, and we try our best. Thank you.